to the webinar this afternoon. Um, I'm going to do a little brief introduction first, but I'm really excited today that we've got Barry Feldman with us. I've followed Barry for many years and taken lots of his advice and uh, a lot of my content results, at least my better content results, are down to advice that I've received from Barry. So I'm really looking forward to the session with him uh, this afternoon. Um, yeah, if you want to move on, my I'm Steve Rayson. So um, if you have any questions after the webinar, do just feel free to tweet me or to mail me and I'll get back to you. Um, uh, as soon as I can. But today we're going to talk about content amplification. So so why? Why content amplification? Um, for me, I think it's just one of the really big issues. It's, it's no longer good enough to write really great content and expect people to find it. You actually need a content amplification strategy for almost every piece of content that you do. And for me, that's so much more than simply you know, tweeting it out, sharing it on social media or mailing people. They may be part of your strategy, but they're just one small part. So we're going to talk about that today. And if you want to join in the conversation, we're going to use the hashtag content amp, which you can see at the bottom of the slide there. So feel free to tweet away, whether it's questions or points from the webinar today. Uh, feel free to just share uh, everything. So, so OK, but, but why is content amplification particularly important? Well, Look at the competition that we've got these days. There's just so much content out there in the world. So this is just WordPress blog posts. So there are now over 70 million WordPress blog posts published every month, and that's just WordPress. It's getting so much easier to create content, not least video, Facebook video. Um, so we're seeing a huge amount of content that we're all competing with. So when we're, we're writing our content, We've really got to amplify it to make sure that people can find it. So just to give an indication as to what sort of competition you're looking at, I did a couple of these. I know they're quite simple, but a couple of these sort of Google searches. So if you're doing something popular like leadership training, 500 million articles there. And uh, talking to, to Barry beforehand, you're not even really competing with those 500 million articles. You're really probably competing or trying to get to the top 10 because most people don't go past page one even if they see page one, which Barry will come on to later, or sales tips, 180 million. And this is a lot of competition. I was actually at a presentation with Joe Pulitzi last year, and Joe said, you know, you've got so much competition, maybe unless you're writing about ferrets. So that sort of got me to have a look at, well, I wonder how many articles there are on ferrets. So even on ferrets, 10 million articles. And again, you're not really competing with all 10 million. You're competing to get through on Google, at least, to the top 10 or so of those articles. So the first reason for amplification is a, a huge volume of content. The second thing I think which is important to understand when it comes to amplification is that there isn't a normal distribution of shares and links. Now you might expect it to look like this. You might expect when you publish content on your blog over the year, you might get some that's low performing, some that's high performing, and some that's average performing. So a typical, what they would call a bell curve distribution. Um, you would expect that, but that isn't what happens. It never happens. So what really happens is something more like this. So if we look at the, the next slide, this distribution is we find this consistently for almost every blog, every big site, whether it's BuzzFeed, right through to our own little blog, um, that most articles get few shares and few links to them from other content. And the ones that do get a lot of shares are actually outliers. And that, that line to the right goes out a long, long way. But most content is actually grouped at that bottom left. And we can see this clearly. When we looked at a random sample of 99,000 posts, we, we chose 100,000 and then we had to remove a few. Um, we can see that most content got few shares and even fewer links. So the average seems really high. So 257, you know, we'd all be happy. That's quite good but that's skewed by that distribution. So you've got some posts there from BuzzFeed that got 400,000 shares. And so the average gets really skewed. Um, and the median is much more relevant. The median is the 50% mark. So at the 50% mark, there was eight shares. So 50% of all those articles got eight shares or less. I think there's something like four or five Facebook and a few of the others. Um, and even more shockingly is that on average, of those 99,000 posts, on average, they didn't even get a single link to the content, um, and the medium was, was zero. And so to me, this comes back to the point, it, it's not failing, I think, because of the quality, but because it lacks an amplification strategy. So my view is you need an amplification strategy because basically your content really only rocks, as we're talking about today, when it reaches an audience. So I'm now going to pass over to Barry to tell us a bit more about how to develop amplification strategies and some of the techniques we can use. So thanks very much, Barry, and uh, over to you. 
All right. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so, yeah, we're here. You probably saw this on Twitter or in the promotional emails that got us here uh, because we need to have our content rock, hence this uh, cool illustration by the Buzz Sumu team. I guess that's me on the left. I I, I don't know how tall um, my buddy over there, Mr. Sumu, is, but I'm not – I don't really uh, – have a red guitar. I have lots of guitars, but uh, mine's not red. And I'm not that tall, and I'm not that thin. That's what I look like right there. I'm a Barry Feldman, your online marketing super freak. So let's talk about how to rock your content. Um, and uh, I guess uh, we didn't do introductions, so I'll just briefly talk about myself. I've been doing this stuff, uh, online marketing, since there was online marketing. So uh, just uh, use your imagination and guess how old I am. But you can see there uh, I'm not a millennial. And so my experience in marketing goes back to uh, when uh, AOL and uh, Netscape and the Sun Networks, probably companies uh, lar largely the audience doesn't even know, uh, brought us the Internet. And so I've been doing online marketing since it existed, and I've been uh, doing copywriting and uh, creative direction, and now I'm a content marketing strategist, expert, helper, writer, planner, all that stuff. And, uh, yeah, we're talking about a pretty grave problem. Steve did a very good job of telling us that uh, there's just too many trees falling in the forest, if you will, right? They, some people call it the, uh, what do they call it, the cricket syndrome. So you, you worked your butt off to make uh, just an amazing piece of content. You know, you, you're, you're not messing around this time, even if you have in the past, and you you poured yourself into it, took 16 hours and six drafts, and you, you made images that look better than ever, and you rallied up your friends in high places to get a little bit of that influencer marketing going. And then, you know, hello, 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 you know, so that uh, echo is, is like a wall in between you and your audience. You did not find an audience with your content, or if we're talking about uh, inbound marketing, you might say uh, the content itself did not find an audience. And so, you know, why? Uh, well, most marketers simply post their content on their blog, and then I, I guess, I hope most dispatch a few updates via their social media networks, and that's all they do. You know, maybe a handful would would disagree and say, "Well, we, you know, we have RSS feeds, or we send it out via email." But there's a lot of ways to promote your content, and for the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you what they are. Now, this is not a formula. You know, the, I simply want to talk about amplification and ways to amplify. I I read, and I don't like this where like. Content marketing experts say, uh, well, it should be an 80-20 ratio, right, or 4 to 1. And so, like, if you spent uh, 4 hours on your content, you should spend 16 on promoting it. Or if you spent 500 bucks on your content, you should spend 2,000 plus on promoting it. Let's dispatch with the formula. There's no formula. There's no 80-20. And even the things that you're going to see today, this is not a step-by-step -step, uh, process uh, whereby if you do all these things, I promise you success. It's not a checklist. It's a long list of ideas. Hopefully, you'll leave with some that you didn't already have or know about that you can try. This thing called content promotion distribution, I think when you add those up, you can call it amplification, is an endless experiment in what works for you in your market with your audience. Okay, So I, I want to warn you that uh, this is not a bunch of boxes to be checked, but a bunch of ideas that hopefully will uh, help you grow your audience. So here we go. Strategies for reaching a larger audience with content promotion and distribution. There are three ways to group the media that you will use. And if you've read about this issue of content distribution, you surely have come across this. I've seen this list expanded uh, because the lines between them are a little blurry, but let's keep it simple and say that uh, there are paid, earned, and owned media strategies, and I'm going to walk you through them in that order. So here we go. Uh, we're rocking out on a stage here uh, with my red Stratocaster and my uh, bass player, Mr. Sumu, and we're going to rock out first with paid distribution strategies, including advertising, sponsorships, and paid promotions. Now, uh, why would you do such a thing? Uh, there are a lot of benefits that come with uh, getting out your checkbook and wallet or credit card in order to uh, pay for content promotion. One is uh, as soon as you're done, your stuff will be online where you placed it. And so it is instant, and uh, the control is higher than all the other strategies we're going to talk about. You decide where and when your targeting capabilities 
are immense. You know, you're not luckily falling into somebody's uh, journey in terms of um, buying, searching, re you know, researching, shopping, what have you, doing social media. You say explicitly where and when, and then therefore you uh, have control that includes uh, dialing it up and dialing it down. Now I should warn you, we're about. I'm about to show you now lots of ways to do paid promotion and lots of those ways are social media and whew, you know I would have to have done this presentation a half an hour before uh, the webinar began to make it so up to date that it kept pace with all the social media advertising options what I'm trying to say is they change relentlessly in fact that was just a reading today let's see I have a note of what it's called because I don't remember oh yeah Twitter's first view video program so I have a post on a social media today today and therefore I was uh, reading the other posts there and that's when I learned about that program so these programs uh, come at us fast and furiously right that's the nature of media the media that are going to be hit are ultimately, whether we like it or not, going to uh, rely on uh, making a living and supporting uh, their existence through advertising. And so those advertising programs compete with each other, and they're in a perpetual state of change. Now, here's here's my this might be the father of them all. I, I think you know Google Paper Clicks probably the granddad. But uh, the reason this conversation about you know pay to play comes up as often as it does is a couple years ago, you know, Facebook said, uh, guess what? Uh, boys and girls, or at least those of you with Facebook pages as opposed to profiles. So pages meaning you know your company. Guess what? Uh, they'll, all those people that you got to follow you with all those tricks that you did. Well, uh, they might be following you, but they are not necessarily seeing your stuff because we apply this uh, algorithm. What's it called? I think it's called Edge Rank. I don't know that that's still the name, or they actually care what it's called, but it does indeed exist and so you might have a thousand followers and no matter what you do uh, you're gonna learn a uh, bummer ten people saw it and then that's not that's not an exaggeration that's about how many people uh, see it if you just organically throw stuff out on your Facebook page uh, without promoting it the percentages are, are pretty dismal and so Facebook's turned into an advertising network uh, at least uh, in, from a business point of view or a business to business point of view and you gotta pay to play so if your uh, Facebook page has 50 likes, I think that's the rule when I last look into it, you can start doing this. And like I said, it has to be a page. And then for as little as $5 a day, you can start to experiment with this program. So it's not going to break the bank, and it is pay-per-click, I think. And, um, pay -per -click? Uh, let's, let's say I don't know. Here's an example of me doing it. Okay, so I, I, I have this uh, workbook, uh, one of my favorite pieces of content and certainly um, one of my audience's favorite pieces of content and I've updated it from time to time and promoted it from time to time and had I just said uh, hey check out the planner uh, again I, I guess I have uh, several thousand people follow me on Facebook uh, that number down there which only I, I would have saw in terms of people reached would have been uh, probably double digits you know 10 to 99 if I got super lucky maybe a hundred or plus but with just a few dollars, I reached, uh, at least at this point in time when I took this snapshot, uh, 2,400 plus people. So small investment in Facebook uh, boosted posts goes a long way. Twitter offers a, a pretty similar program. I recall seeing uh, both on Twitter and on Hootsuite, and you know there are a lot of variations of dashboards you'll use to uh, keep your eye on your social accounts, especially Twitter, uh, that... Uh, that would include uh, their advertisements and so I, I, I remember seeing these at the top all the time so I think Twitter's experimenting with that now and more often I see this in the sidebar but one way or another it's only fair game for uh, the media from which uh, is interrupting your organic uh, stream uh, it's only fair for them to show you that they are indeed featuring an ad so uh, face or uh, Twitter does that subtly here with that uh, thing you see the arrow pointing to a little yellow thing that says promoted by Outmark market so this is an example of a promoted tweet and um, those are pay-per-click programs so um, I'm not sure if like Facebook it has a, a minimum buy-in but the good news is you are not going to um, pay unless it works it's a pay-per-click program so same thing over on LinkedIn and again you know, I didn't update this this morning so who knows what's changed LinkedIn certainly has changed a lot and if you've been paying close attention you know everything the programs the interface you know what's free and what isn't and so forth but 
uh, they too want to increase their uh, um, revenues and they do that through advertising programs and there are quite a few of them a couple of years ago they actually bought a company called Bizio to strengthen uh, the, the strategies that you can use to reach highly targeted markets so amongst those programs are the LinkedIn sponsored updates and that means that you have to uh, have a business account to use these and uh, they will be highly targeted here's an, I can show you an example from Adobe YouTube ads, these are kind of cool. They do well. The rules have changed a lot in these things, too. You know, sometimes they come, uh, you're going to watch video, and uh, you have to watch a video that precedes it. Sometimes uh, you have to watch a video that precedes it for a few seconds. Uh, the ads appear in your stream. Sometimes uh, while you're surfing YouTube, they appear over on the side. And so, you know, uh, I'll have to get back to you on today's rules. But uh, YouTube ads are uh, called, they, they call them exactly what they are. They're ads and uh, they can be shown in a number of ways and they can be customized in a number of ways. They, they become very direct response-y such that uh, if you, you know, use the tools they provide you, you can ask your viewers to click straight from uh, the video that they're watching into uh, the page that you want them to go to. So a promising media if indeed uh, you make video or suspect that your audience is consuming YouTube and uh, Chances are pretty good they are because YouTube is popular. You need, by the way, uh, YouTube is owned by Google, and so to get started with this program, you're gonna it's, it's powered by Google AdWords, which we'll talk about. So you'll, you'll need to have an account uh, set up for Google AdWords, which uh, won't cost you anything to start with. Stumble upon is uh, big news. Over 35 million people use it to discover content on a monthly basis. And what they see is uh, they set it up with their preferences and they stumble upon stuff, you know, and hence the name. And I think they, you know, as a user, you have some degree of control over what that stuff is. And then in that stream will be uh, sponsored ads. And so you can see here that that's oh so subtle. And uh, my arrow points out what I mean by that. So if you haven't tried to stumble upon, you might. And uh, Reddit is another one. Reddit uh, is very, very popular and has, uh, well, sometimes they've called themselves the front page of the internet. I don't know about that. It's not my front page. And, <clears throat> excuse me, as you see here, you sort of have to muscle your way through a uh, chaotic interface, which uh, has not slowed them down. Um, let's see, I have some numbers here. Yeah, Reddit uh, gets billions of page views every month and the, what's what's happening on Reddit um, people are exchanging con <coughs> content and comments and uh, there's an endless dialogue going on and the good news is there are communities they call them for absolutely everything and so you can um, I've heard lots of people tell me they've had uh, lots of success promoting their content on Reddit once they learned how to uh, get through Reddit and find their audience and find the right community and so there's a ad at the top there that is sponsored and you know they were slightly deliberate about showing it to you you know it's in the first position it has a colored background and it says sponsored link so that's what that looks like let me take a drink here <clears throat> all right onward we go with paid programs native advertising is one of them and so the idea in native advertising is that the advertising looks like the um, content that a publisher publishes that isn't paid for and that's why they call it native and so you can see here I don't know what what uh, site I'm on when I made this slide I don't remember but it's a news site and uh, you can see uh, the stories they're, they're not, not a very good story but <laughs> or a nice story but off to the left uh, you see content that looks just like it and it's presented by Maxwell House so it's a story about uh, coffee beans and so that's native advertising and because of media's need to uh, support itself through uh, dollars uh, you'll find that these programs are offered just about everywhere and so you might uh, experiment with it. I haven't, uh, I don't have exact prices for you, but I think, you know, depending on the size of the audience, you will expect these programs, native advertising programs, uh, to be uh, more expensive than your social media advertising. But, uh, but ultimately it comes down to, you know, the results you get. So I don't know that that's actually a fair thing to say, but I guess I'm warning you that $5 won't get you into a mainstream site where you think you're going to find a huge audience. And so, 
Now you'll have to get your wallet out to experiment with this program or those programs. Here's another one. You see these all over the place now, and uh, sometimes uh, they're so sensational that I, I think twice about recommending them, but they're called Content Discovery Networks, and those three brands that I mentioned are amongst the most popular, but uh, there are plenty more, and uh, this isn't going anywhere, f going away fast, so you'll see uh, companies besides these. And what happens here is you're seeing beneath the content that you are interested in and in reading uh, suggestions for further reading. And on a, a handheld device, uh, this is what that looks like over there. On a screen, there's usually images and, and I say that it's getting kind of a sensational because they, they sometimes sort of reek of the tabloids that you see at the checkout counter at the grocery store with um, you know, celebrity look-alikes and what they looked like when they were younger and you know the latest on Taylor Swift and what have you but uh, at the same time uh, you know it's a competitive market and it's taken more seriously on B2B and therefore when you uh, when you start experimenting with this program uh, you'll go through one of these companies such as Outbrain and uh, again I think you'll pay per click not exposure and so you'll have to uh, do it to learn from it and see if it works but it's certainly a popular and obvious way to promote your content so you might consider trying it pay per click can't be left out of uh, this discussion like I said at the beginning it's kind of the granddad of the category pay per click uh, has changed a bit over the years and so Google tinkers with it here and there sometimes they make changes that that uh, hurts the advertiser and therefore the advertising revenue from Google or being I should mention that uh, Microsoft has a uh, very similar program as does every search engine and these are the big two uh, when you go with Bing from Microsoft you're, you're actually uh, investing in Yahoo at the same time it's the same advertising network and so on Google what it looks like uh, the paid ads have a little tiny uh, icon or you know, rounded cornered square that say ad those used to be uh, colorized I think it was green and then it was yellow and today it just has a white background and uh, look at what I got here I took Steve's uh, term that he was experimenting with to make his point earlier and, and put it in leadership training and uh, I assume that I was doing such on an iPad you know, you turn sideways and on a horizontal screen I see four ads they, they no longer are on the right column but they're at the top and the bottom of the page and so we're looking at the top and then I see um, I forgot what you call that thing below, but I, I guess Google calls it its, it's a knowledge graph, and you'll often see you know, something like that there, that what they think is the thing that you're most looking for. And then just falling off the bottom of the page, finally organic results. So to uh, be seen in many cases for specific terms on Google, uh, though, uh, you know, certainly a lot of reasons to learn how to succeed with organic traffic. Uh, sometimes it pays to invest in pay-per-click because of its prominence on the page and also uh, because of what you'll learn from doing it. Your investments in pay-per-click are going to be uh, fruitful in terms of what you learn and how you apply it to your organic search. In other words, you're going to learn uh, what keywords work and what uh, people are clicking and so forth. So, pay-per-click by uh, Google AdWords and Bing is uh, something you should try. Particularly, I say this to all my clients that are new. You know, I, I don't know. I, by new, I mean like they're f they have a new website or they have their first website or they have a new blog and uh, traffic doesn't magically appear, right? And so, uh, while I certainly want to help them succeed with social media and search and email, now, some of those rewards come kind of slowly over time and uh, pay-per-click rewards come instantly so I usually recommend if uh, you are struggling with getting started and finding an audience uh, that you invest uh, early and often in pay-per-click and then over time you can dial that down. Retargeting, I think you're probably familiar with this and, and uh, that gets pretty subtle. Retargeting is uh, it's, it kind of feels like ghosts in the machine sometimes and you know, it's kind of creepy. You're, at a website and then you're at a different website and whoa there's an ad from the website that you were at you know before or yesterday or last week so what's happening is um, your visits are being tracked through the use of cookies and because uh, it's so obvious you know 98 percent or more of people that come to websites are going to leave without uh, buying without trying without handing over their email address and so you are uh, retargeting them or remarketing sometimes the programs are called that 
And uh, you do this, by the way, through a variety of companies, and I've listed some of these here. And you buy ads that um, <laughs> chase your former website visitors around. You know, it might be specific to a product or service that you offer. And so this is an example in social media today where uh, upper right here is a display ad, uh, the, the horizontal old-fashioned kind. I can make it go away with that little X I point to, uh, or I can say it's irrelevant to me. Probably most people did not know that or don't ever touch that, but it's an ad by Salesforce Marketing Cloud, and that's probably because I was at that website uh, doing research or learning more about uh, their product, which is a marketing automation solution. Okay, so uh, retargeting is going to be uh, highly relevant, and uh, boy, a lot of people are very fond of the uh, programs and the results they've got uh, because um, it's working. And so while a lot of people, when they do display advertising, display products and services, it's a good idea now to make that product actually content. Right, so let's see what Salesforce is offering me here. Yeah, they're offering me answers, so I don't know. That's probably a paper, a research, or some sort. And so, the, uh, you know, the product, the the uh, advertiser is thinking of the content as the product. So, thus concludes chapter one of our three uh, slices of uh, how to promote your content or amplify it uh, with uh, the things that cost money. What about the things that don't? Earned media. Uh, customers become the channel here, the all-powerful uh, word of mouth. I think this term earned media has been around forever, and we have uh, public relations to thank for that, right? You don't pay for it, and you don't control it. Uh, you earn it. You know, you get free ink, if you will, even if uh, the ink is, is digital ink. And so it comes with its own set of benefits. And they are these. You get uh, probably more credibility than you would if you paid for it uh, because uh, you didn't pay for it and you earned it. And it's hopefully somebody of some level of influence is uh, sharing content that you've created and therefore that comes with credibility. You're going to find that earned media is probably going to convert at a higher rate, you know, because with it comes this idea of social proof. It's a higher in terms of its trust value, and so it's going to turn into business more often than uh, paid media and possibly uh, the media we're going to talk about next, owned media. And uh, the lifespan is uh, longer. You know, when, when your $5 runs out on your sponsored Facebook ad, your um, Digital footprint does too, right? Ad programs uh, disappear before your very eyes when they're not paid for anymore. You know, that is not the case with earned media. It's typically organic and it lands on uh, channels such as uh, blogs and uh, online magazines and social media and so forth. And so uh, it's free. I mean, it takes work to get this done, but you do not pay for earned media. And so uh, first and foremost in the earned media strategy is guest blogging. So you've created great content, and boy, if, if it's the only place it ever appears is your website, you're really doing yourself a disservice. You know, that's an island that just might not be visited enough ever. You know, so here's an example of a popular blog in our industry, uh, HubSpot, uh, one of the you know, pioneers of, of what they call inbound marketing. And uh, this guy is from Price Weber, as it, it term, as indicated by his Twitter handle there. And his name is Eric, I hope, <laughs> has an H at the end. And uh, like me, he writes for HubSpot. He's not paid for it. He's guest blogging. I, 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 you know, I can put on a whole presentation about guest blogging, and I won't. But I uh, should admit that it's really, you know, for years, and, and this continues today. I started blogging in 2011. It is and was and uh, probably will remain my marketing strategy. I mean, I, I've dabbled with a lot of these strategies I'm telling you about, but you know, guest blogging is number one. And so I, I often write for uh, the popular publications in my niche, and you should too. And uh, you, you'll need to do a little more work to get it done. You know, you'll need to rewrite what you've written, or you'll need to just give them exclusive, fresh content that's never been shown anywhere before. But you are going to succeed in getting your name out there. You know, you're going to basically find an audience where the audience lives, and then hope to send them back to your website. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, how to do that. 
Syndicated content is really kind of a close relative to uh, what we just talked about, guest blogging. What you do is you earn the trust of a website uh, in your industry such that it gets easier to guest blog. And so it gets easier in, in a couple of ways. One is if you have a relationship with somebody who's going to syndicate your content, that is basically pick it up and rerun it on their media, uh, you probably don't have to rewrite it. You, know, you, you probably it's, it's probably recognized that it was previously published and, and they probably say as much and then uh, a lot of times you probably don't even have to um, contact them you just set up a relationship such that they have a feed and they know when you publish on your website so, that, so these programs work in different ways like uh, I've mentioned already that I write for social media today and I do that often and uh, that's syndicated but uh, it's not automatic or at least for me it isn't I manually tell them when I want to run a story but if you are indeed blogging regularly and you're getting good at it, you should look into opportunities to syndicate your content and uh, it becomes amongst the most easiest ways to do uh, content amplification for earned media. Now, getting curated basically means that uh, people who have curation platforms, and there are many, these are uh, two that are uh, I know of and are favorites of months because a lot of people scoop it and paperly, uh, but that list is long. Uh, this is this is awesome. If you create a lot of content and you put it in your audience's way, uh, they are going to not only share it on social media, but you know, put it into their newsletters and roundups and what have you. There's a lot of ways to curate content, and ultimately they're going to put them in in their blogs too, or you know, cite you in their blogs. But there's no magic button to push here. You can't, you know, this this is a little bit different in terms of strategy. You can't just go, I will now get curated. So just keep that in mind that the more you put it out there. Uh, the more uh, you're going to kind of get lucky too, and so getting curated, I guess, is a matter of getting lucky and and uh, influencer marketing, you know, making friends where you should. Speaking of influencer marketing, uh, that's my next strategy. This is a, a little uh, meta for if your brain starts spinning. I understand. This is an example, and in the example, it is influential marketers <laughs> that are friends of mine sharing uh, ideas about influence marketing. You with me? Okay, so that's that was a lot of things, and the easiest way to show it to you uh, was this infographic. And so I, I think there's 22 of these people, and they're people that I know uh, from uh, marketing circles and conferences and guest blog opportunities and so forth. And so uh, perhaps as meaningful as any strategy is getting people that uh, have an audience uh, to share content with, share your content, uh, include you in their content, like they're going to do. Uh, interviews or podcasts or they're going to do roundup posts you know whereby um, maybe they have one question that they ask a, a large panel of people you, know, you see that strategy a lot in blogging so yeah again you know a topic unto itself and it could easily have a long webinar about uh, influencer marketing but uh, that should go in your earned media strategy as well social media of course uh, building a social media following is key to earning media mentions. You know, so even though I said don't do that and that only at the beginning of the show, I didn't want to leave it out. Social media relationships are uh, very often reciprocal, right? Uh, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. You help each other with mentions and shares and all those little things you can click on the various channels. And so here are some of them. Blog comments, that's on the left. I think that's a Social Media Examiner, and that's uh, me. I, th I think we're, we're talking about a post that I wrote there, and um, some people I know and some I don't. In fact, I know two of the three people on that page um, commenting with me, and they probably shared it, and uh, we've started a conversation and dialogue in the stream of a blog. That's a good thing. Over on the right, a, a Twitter uh, tweet. You know, there's a little luck involved. Uh, Mari Smith has much, a much larger audience than me and uh, well known for her books about Facebook and her uh, she has just a, a massive uh, digital footprint as a popular speaker and when she shares my stuff you know I have a good day on Twitter so uh, I know her ever so slightly but um, she found my my story and shared it so that was a big coup for me and then down below you see Brian Dean that's a Twitter card we'll talk about that in a second Twitter cards uh, add media to your tweets such that uh, they, they have more stopping power. Search, you know, talk about a topic that I could uh, go on and on for, and uh, that's not going to happen here today. But you certainly do want to get found via search, as Steve showed you at the beginning. You know, any old term is going to come back with millions or billions of results on Google, and there's really only ten that matter. 
you know, the first page of Google is where you want to be seen. The joke is uh, the, the best place to hide a dead body is the second page of Google. And so if you want to get found via search, you have to create incredibly high quality content, optimize it such that the, uh, you know, the um, search engines recognize its relevance, and then um, promote it, promote it, promote it. Hopefully you'll see it. Uh, go viral or get popular in terms of shares on social media and earn its way up the ranks in search. And so uh, don't count out search, you know, um, and uh, learn it if you haven't and apply it. Uh, again, not a magic button you push here, but word of mouth. This is a research probably from a couple years ago. Yeah, it's comparing 2007 to 2013. Um, but nothing makes it irrelevant, though it is four years old. It's the same story over and over again. The most trusted form of any advertising in media is going to be the all-powerful word of mouth. So they know that media can just simply be conversations, but because it's so easy to have conversations digitally, you know, word of mouth often is called word of mouse now, if you will, if you actually still use a mouse. Um, but, but yeah, so you are uh, trying to earn media uh, and earn the love, admiration, and advocacy of people such that you get recommendations, uh, you get um, branded uh, websites, uh, you get opinions posted online, editorial content. These are forms of word of mouth that hopefully you're striving to achieve. And that wraps up uh, that next chapter. Now let's talk about owned media. And I got a blast fast here, so save time for questions, which I think will go up to 9.30 Pacific time. So yeah, we got 22 minutes. I'm doing good. Here we go. Own media. I mean, I'm doing good for timing. You tell me whether I'm doing good for sharing information. Own media, uh, you know, we went paid, earn, paid uh, earned, owned, okay? So own media might be uh, your website, your blog. Uh, probably you can debate a little bit here uh, whether or not it includes social media channels and email marketing, but for the uh, purpose of this presentation, it does include social media channels and email marketing while you earn email addresses and social media channels are really owned by somebody else. Uh, I like to think you have a lot of control over them and therefore you know you you own that uh, you own that tribe I suppose that follows you on social media. Even though things can and do change. Alright, so the benefits of owned media are control and uh, like I said there's some compromises there with some channels like uh, Facebook's you know gonna exercise controls that you uh, simply have to live with. But when it comes to your blog and your uh, website and your email programs, uh, you decide what goes there and when and how often and, and everything else. Uh, typically cost effective to use own media as opposed to buying it. Uh, of course, uh, you increase its longevity, you know, whatever you put on your website and blog is forever or at least it's there until you take it away and so it also offers great versatility because you're in control and there's so many media options now. Email marketing that comes first here. Email is the most pervasive medium in business today and therefore is the top uh, con promotion tactic of many marketers. Don't let uh, the, you know, the, you know, the millennial generation who doesn't check their email maybe as often as they should. Maybe they're in school and they're much, they're much more keen on Snapchat than they are on email, uh, don't let that fool you. You know, people that are doing business and buying stuff uh, probably uh, skip breakfast more often than they skip checking their email in the morning. So uh, to succeed, you need to build uh, an email, um, a successful email platform and program, and do so with a real live uh, official email service provider or a marketing automation platform that makes it easy to do. So uh, amongst the uh, tricks of the trade that you'll want to do as you use email marketing to promote your content. You should make it easy for people to get on your list and you do that with opt-in forms. That uh, might be more effective now if it includes an offer. So sometimes like this screen, this is not what it looks like anymore on my website, but uh, it is from my website and it was uh, the way that I was promoting my email list and I had some degree of success and it's simply, you know, you get on our email list, but it's probably a little better than some of those pleas because it gives you reasons to get on your email list. And so 
Uh, that that should be an option probably throughout your website. If you have a sidebar, it's a logical place to put that. Uh, you might put email opt-in forms at the bottom of your blog post. You know, with the assumption that uh, you're succeeding, people are paying attention. People got to the bottom; they want, might want more. But also, you should make your forms uh, promote sizable things, uh, sizable or more meaningful pieces of content. They don't have to be sizable. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, like the long list of lead magnets, which should roll off my tongue because it's like the thing I talk about most. But you know, your checklist, your templates, your assessments, your research reports, um, free memberships, uh, mini series of uh, mini courses that are delivered via uh, email or video or so forth. All those things should be offered such that you're growing your list. So here's an example of uh, what an ebook on my website looks like when you click through and say uh, count me in uh, you fill out a form on a landing page um, it seems to me landing pages are getting less popular uh, than they used to be with the growth of mobile and uh, how easy it is now to do pop-ups and sliders and exit intent but it's all kind of the same thing right you have a page whether it's a, a whole page or a piece of a page that's a window uh, you promote a piece of content that uh, you think is highly relevant to your audience in this case I'm you know, talking to digital marketers I've written a rather lengthy ebook about the tricks of the trade of email marketing and uh, you get that by handing over this information so you'll you want to uh, try landing pages and or pop-ups and uh, email marketing, of course, includes the making of email, and it's a fairly flexible medium. Uh, you look at here some of the different tricks I've tried over the years. Get Magnetic was kind of my main newsletter. AEIOU was was a curated uh, email that went out once a month, where uh, those letters stood for articles, ebooks, interviews, online line tools and useful tips. Uh, that that became a bit of a beast to keep up with, so I didn't. And then. On the right is another forum where I just promote uh, through feeds my uh, blog posts. And so uh, all these options, newsletters, offers, promotions, of course, autoresponders, very popular tactic for a newcomer to your email list or a specific email list to get a series of emails that are automatically sent, uh, usually leading towards uh, an offer of some sort so that you actually uh, move the needle on your business and sell stuff. Social media marketing. Okay, so I, I got to stop here and say, yeah, we talked about it a little bit in earned media. It's a part of that story. And here, it's a, maybe a little bit of a confusing part of the story because uh, you don't get so much control that you own it. But I like to think, you know, I, I'm, I'm a Twitter maniac and I'm, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. And then at the periphery, uh, you know, I touch and use Facebook and Instagram and uh, other social media a little bit. I like to think, you know, I've worked hard to create audiences there, particularly on Twitter, and uh, I own them, right? I mean, I'm, Twitter can change the rules, but uh, I think of this as uh, owned media and therefore in this section is, is uh, recommendations for how to use social media. And uh, let's start here with uh, the Twitter card. I thought I was going to get back to talking about the Twitter cards. Or, no, I guess that's next. Okay, this is a content tweet right so you're you're using social media as you should to promote content particularly Twitter you are uh, not going to increase people's love for you if all you do is uh, sell your services your brand your products yourself what you want to do is promote content as um, co-schedule is done here and they've done so with um, including a link of course uh, I don't know why I so often see content promoted without a link is probably just people being careless and then using media so that media uh, here is an image and that's the most popular and probably e easiest way to do it but that can also include uh, video and gifs and uh, maybe more uh, certainly you earn more attention on the page when you're competing with text only uh, tweets or updates of any kind on any media uh, when your uh, update looks better you know it, takes up more real estate, it's more colorful. So Twitter cards is a little program, there, there is a little bit of shenanigans you gotta go through with Twitter to set it up, but it's worth it. And so when people uh, go the easy route on my website and just uh, click tweet to share something, uh, they, don't, they don't just share uh, the text of, of the auto-populated tweet, uh, they share uh, this, this is a Twitter card, and so they write what they want to, you know, I use an example where 
she said something great. You know, she said, "Can I say I love this?" So she can, and she did, because she does. She loves my story, and so um, she, you know, she put a little more effort into it than just clicking tweet. But she didn't have to do the lower part of that, which is the Twitter card. It shows it's not cropped as wonderfully as I might have hoped, but it shows the image that I used, and it shows a snippet that. Uh, summarizes the story kind of like so she doesn't have to it shows my uh, title and it shows uh, my name or the name of my company so Twitter cards are uh, beautiful things and there's there's a whole bunch of different kinds of Twitter cards so when you learn about that program uh, you'll learn about the different varieties this is this is called a, uh, a view summary link I think don't quote me on that uh, social media marketing, you know, the, the list is kind of long, so consider these things as you uh, use uh, what is uh, free tools and uh, own media. LinkedIn groups, you know, it, it, you, you want to join LinkedIn groups, you want to have a dialogue there, you don't want to be like too heavy on the link bombing, you know, where people are going to sort of stop paying attention to you or, or stop following you or kick you out. But LinkedIn groups uh, often are a relevant place to share your content. Tagging peers, you can do that rather easily. On Twitter, you, you can make that even more expansive if you do it with the image, um, you know, because you're going to run out of room in your tweet with the character count. Um, but you can uh, tag 10 people when you put something on Twitter that includes an image. Uh, I haven't talked a lot about Pinterest, but um, I probably should have. Um, Pin, Pinterest is certainly a good place to extend your uh, reach. And uh, you can uh, make uh, pin boards that uh, act uh, as kind of, kind of a permanent member of the digital universe. You can use hashtags, uh, kind of an interesting topic that we won't have time to get into in depth. But um, you can, you know, people are going to use hashtags to specifically hunt down content, and so that tip applies to uh, amplifying your content. Uh, you know, pick the keyword. Sometimes a word that uh, is two words, you know. Content marketing uh, has to be smushed together so that it is a, ma a hashtag. Uh, ask for shares. That tip is amazingly uh, heard too infrequently. You get more social media shares when you tell people to share it. So do that and then quote experts. We talked a little bit about influencer marketing. Uh, you want to do that for uh, for credibility, uh, but also you know most people that are quoted uh, reciprocate by sharing it. You know you've sort of uh, stroked their ego. Uh, your blog. Let's just say real quickly that you uh, are blogging and don't make it hard for people to share your blog. So uh, I, I'm flabbergasted how often I see a blog and I don't see uh, share buttons or they're hard to find or they disappear or they're grayed back or you know they're um, only at the top. Now this example is at the top. Uh, it might be at the bottom uh, but the strongest share bars are those that stay on screen and go with you so that person doesn't have to um, be at the beginning or go back to the beginning. And he doesn't have to have completed your blog post either. They can share it whenever they feel like it uh, because the button's you know on their screen. So uh, don't make the mistake of making it hard for you to share your stuff. And here's some uh, blogging tips you can also apply. You can use uh, this is discuss. I'm not never really sure how you say that. Discus, discuss. D-I-S-Q-U-S. I use it on my blog. A very similar product as Live Fire, and uh, these companies, uh, these are not their only products, but these are the, these are popular products, and those are like a, a plug-in that you apply to your WordPress blog so that uh, a lot of good things happen. Here's three things that happen with these arrows. The first is uh, people's uh, sh picture is shown when they comment on your blog, which probably uh, helps convince them to get involved. Secondly, you have a suggested reading, and so you might increase the stickiness of your blog. And then uh, finally, you sort of have a social media unto itself because uh, you get, you know, disc when you get comments on Discus, it creates uh, emails. And so uh, conversations often uh, ensue in the blog uh, post commentary section. You don't have to uh, keep your eye on it to know about it. Uh, when you blog, use images. I, I so often see blogs that are um, big balls of copy and they, uh, they turn you off. So, uh, you know, you just think about the psychology of the viewer, uh, make the page uh, have lots of white space and good looking images. Uh, make it easy for people to share in this way too with a um, pre-formatted click to tweets. Uh, every social media has uh, buttons that you can you know, click to pin and that sort of thing. And so uh, this is a real popular one. Again, sort of showing my Twitter bias here. Let's see, I got 10 minutes to go, so I'm going to wrap it up real fast here. Uh, expand your digital footprint with free 
content platforms. I love this tip. You know, you um, might not own any of these things specifically, but you have complete control uh, because no editors get uh, you know stand between you and the audience. Uh, on these media, and there's probably plenty of them in in every sort of vertical media. So, in uh, mainstream media, you know, nobody from YouTube tells you what you can or can't put on your uh, brand's channel. So, create a channel and expand your digital footprint there. On iTunes, you do the same with a podcast. On SlideShare, you do the same with presentations and infographics. I've had an amazing amount of success and traction from SlideShare, and it generates a good deal of traffic to my website because of well, the quality of the content uh, that I put there. And then Scribe, probably a little lesser known, but that's a place where, again, uh, after having filled out an application, you can promote your content in the form of PDFs and, and various types of uh, digital publishing uh, without an editor being involved and telling you yes or no. Uh, employees, this is uh, often overlooked if you have them, uh, if they're in the marketing department, if they're social media savvy, if they're writers, you know, you need to foster employee advocacy. You need to have deliberate programs that give your employees ownership. If they need to be trained, you know, your company might uh, get involved in that and then you empower them uh, to become uh, spokespersons for your company you know and so suddenly this one man you know content marketing amplification <laughs> distribution promotion machine you know can multiply into a 25 person uh, you know platoon if you will and so yeah you might have to govern them there might have to be rules that you set up in your training but uh, it's amazing how often that uh, the idea of sharing stuff and doing all this sort of digital PR and social media promotions is uh, is a one man show, and that's 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 asking too much of one man or woman. Repurposable content, uh, just a real quick idea here. When you create big pieces of content, as demonstrated by this little um, graphic by uh, Column Five Media, uh, what what we mean here is that you have a piece of content, and, and think of this as an ebook. And, uh, and you can even think of this, this presentation as an example because this presentation was an ebook and it was blog post and it was all these things. And, um, and now it's a webinar, right? So it's, it's repurposable and it's going to spin itself into lots of pieces of smaller content, particularly for social media. Audit your content assets. Um, by that I mean, you know, don't, don't let it be lost on you what your content actually is. You can't amplify, you know, what you don't see. And so think uh, about uh, returning to your website and your blog and taking inventory of what you have and then thinking about how it might be repurposed. You know, even your email outbasket, if you will, uh, outbox is going to have content uh, that's ripe for becoming, becoming blog posts because you're answering questions. Your salespeople are going to have presentations. You know, the list is long. You're going to find more stuff to amplify uh, when you go looking for it. Maximize your formats. This is Kapost's uh, resource library, and you can see uh, in the column to the left of this massive array of stuff are these filters that says you can you can uh, look for stuff by categories and content types. I love that approach, and um, that's because it helps me find what I'm looking for quickly. You know, I can say I want to learn about production with the eBooks and videos, and uh, this list goes swoop and it gets smaller. So uh, create that function or feature on your blog if you can, or on a resource page uh, to uh, make more formats available to more people. Everybody has sort of different media consumption preferences. And uh, I. I conclude here. Like I said, this is not a formula. I don't want you to go back and do all 30 or 35 of these things tomorrow. I want you to begin to experiment. And so as you amplify your stuff, you will integrate these strategies. You'll experiment. You know, you'll, you'll look at what worked, what didn't, what was the return on investment, how much time and money is it costing us. And then uh, you'll get better at the ones that uh, hopefully are, are helping you. So uh, I hope that stuff was helpful. Uh, to wrap it up now, here is a strategy that should not be overlooked. Everything you do, all these strategies that I said, talked about, you know, don't take for granted that people are going to look you up or, or you know, find you on your LinkedIn profile or do the research. So make everything point back to your blog and website. 
and again um, revisit what you're doing with uh, analytics. We'll just keep it keep it at that for now so there's time for me to answer your questions. Uh, if you're looking for the infomercial hard sell commercial part of this presentation, you know, typically in a webinar the last 15 minutes is dedicated to the webinar guest uh, cramming his product down your throat. I got bad news for you. I have no product to cram down your throat. I have an ebook to give you. It's not even gated. Uh, probably, probably could be or should be, but I wrote it a couple of years ago, and uh, it was offered uh, through CoSchedule. Uh, we did this together. I, I wrote it, and they designed it and promoted it for me. It's called Amplify Content Turn Up Demand, and you can have it, and I made that a simple URL for you so that you can just jot down my website, filmcreative.com slash amplify. You know, while you're there, it wouldn't hurt if you gave me your email address. If you're, if you're not on my email list, I'd like you to be, uh, but you're soon going to get an email from me because BuzzSumo is going to share the list. So you'll hear from me, and I won't I won't bother you. I'll just email you once and ask you to uh, join my list or, or offer something that I think will be relevant. But there is no products or services for sale here today. Sorry about that. And uh, I'm done. There's me, there's Steve, and we do have a few minutes to answer your questions. Fantastic. Thanks, Barry. That's uh, uh, excellent. Um, it's a bit like drinking from a fire hose. There's almost so much stuff in there. <laughs> I've got to go back myself and rethink our amplification. I thought we had quite a lot of elements in our strategy, but there are lots more that we need to experiment with. So we've had lots of questions. We won't be able to answer all of the questions today, but I'll, I'll put some of the questions to, to Barry as we, we need to finish up shortly. But uh, Yeah, and I'll answer them all, like if, if they can be tweeted, you know, but maybe not live. But yeah, let's not let them slip away. We'll, we'll answer yeah. them. No, we'll also, just to let people know, we also, we do keep a tab on all the questions that have asked and we will try to get back to you and answer them. What we'll also do is we, we'll write up a blog post, it'll probably be early next week now, based on this webinar where we take all the questions and a lot of the advice that Barry's given, so we write it up so you get the write-up as well. You'll also get sent a copy of the slides um, and a copy of the recording, so, but that'll probably be Friday now by the time we've just uh, edited it out and, and got it ready for you. But well, I can, I can go a few minutes over if you want to. I mean, there's no big hurry to get off okay. of this. Okay, um, just a couple of quick questions. Then. Someone's asked about syndicating content. What do you think about syndicating content to, to places like Medium or Huffington Post? Uh, any views on those? Uh, yeah, you know, that, put that on your list of, of places to experiment. I actually wanted to mention those, not, not necessarily Huffington Post, but maybe. Um, I guess you mean like places in which uh, you can copy and paste stuff you've written elsewhere and certainly Medium makes that very easy. I love their interface and I get some traction. I do that every once in a while and LinkedIn belongs on that list too. Uh, I'm not sure how the Huffington Post thing works. I think they might give you access to their CMS. Somebody would have to chime in on that. But yeah, uh, and, you know, more pages is more exposure. That's that's what amplification is. So uh, try it, you know. But then go back and measure it. If you're, you know, if you, everything you ever write goes across the board on LinkedIn and Medium, and it's not helping the cause, you know, don't waste your time. Yeah, I would say monitor it. I mean, someone's asked, but what about the issues around duplicate content? And I'd always say, sometimes we always leave a gap. I, I occasionally repost something onto to LinkedIn Pulse, and I'm amazed sometimes how well it does, sometimes better than the original post, but I always leave a gap. And if you're doing that, you always need to have the sort of canonical URL pointing you to the original content or being very clear with the original content is. Um, yeah, I had a slide. Know. I had a slide that said uh, increase your digital footprint, right, or expand your digital footprint, and that and that's a way to do it. And so that's sort of like a hybrid with syndicated. I, I think a syndicated content in most cases is like totally automatic. You know, the the syndicator has a feed or some for some reason has an eye on your content, and so you don't have to do anything. But uh, the the question that it was just posed was you do have to do stuff, but it's amazingly easy. You know, Medium uh, in particular, well, LinkedIn too. They made a beautiful uh, interface where. A co the copy and paste operation takes just a couple of seconds. Yeah. So I was just asked, Barry, do you have any tools or templates you recommend to organize your paid media budget? Mm, no. Yeah, I, I think you, you probably do want to organize it. Uh, your credit card statement would show you where it <laughs> went. Um, you probably want to, um, yeah, set up some sort of dashboard or yeah. monitoring. Uh, you know the. Uh, you're probably you know the man. He's uh, over on your side of the pond. Ian Cleary. He's the answer man for all things about tools. And so I'd look at his website, which is called uh, Razor Social. I don't do a lot of paid uh, advertising uh, through social media, but I have. I've, I've dabbled in most of the things I presented to you, to you today, and and I still get back to Facebook advertising once in a while. But um, you know, no matter what they are, like if it's Facebook or um, 
uh, AdWords or whatever, uh, you know, you're going to get uh, email from them. Uh, you're going to get uh, probably bugged a little bit, you know, like after your money runs out to uh, you know, put more money in the bank. And so it's not like you're going to lose track of where your dollars are going. So you don't really need tools if you don't want them because the uh, media that uh, you, know, spent, you spent your money with is a tool. Yeah, and there are, there are lots of tools out there to manage ads and AdWords and Facebook ads, etc. So if you just search for it. But as, uh, as Barry said, um, Ian Clear is a great resource to go to. So it's just RazorSocial.com. He does reviews of all those tools. You can just search uh, his site for, for ones that are relevant. Um, other questions that are coming in, um, how effective are share buttons and comment boxes on your blog? Um, I think they're just probably essentials in, in some ways, particularly the share buttons. But any thoughts on that, Barry? Yes, I, I mean, one thought is have them. It's crazy if you uh, are interested in building an audience and you make it hard for people to share your content, so use the share buttons. Like I said, make them vertical, make them practical. You know, sometimes I see them and they're like, you know, buffer and flipboard and then there's no LinkedIn and Twitter and I don't get it. You know, you better, you know, have some reason why LinkedIn and Twitter aren't there. You know, maybe, maybe LinkedIn's irrelevant, but yeah, think about that. And then I'd say generally, you know, a lot of times people turn the counters off. I say turn the counters on. You know, I guess they might turn the counters off because they don't want to see a bunch of zeros up there. But don't allow there to be zeros up there. You know, you can share your own stuff to get it started. And that those numbers, when they accumulate, when one, you know, comes zero becomes one, and then one becomes five, and five becomes ten, that's a form of social proof too, yeah. right? And so I think that's a really critical point that it, that that actually popular content becomes more popular in a way. It's a bit like is it a lot of people sort of pay to get books bought, get on bestseller lists, etc. It becomes social proof. So, and I'm always amazed at how little people use their own staff to share and, and friends to share. So I've seen posts for quite big brands getting just 30 shares. You're thinking even your staff aren't sharing it. And if your staff aren't sharing it, why should other people share your content? So I do think you can use staff, and I do think some paid amplification can be a way of kickstarting. Sometimes some paid boosting. Uh, we boost some of our blog posts on Facebook, and often you just see that, and it gains some initial traction, which gives you that social proof. So I would agree with you there, Barry. I think that's really important. Yeah, the Somebody creation of a, let me make one comment on that. The yeah. creation of like a, a social culture and, uh, and and the creation of, of building an army of advocates within your company, you know, is probably uh, something that requires more thinking and and, uh, and purposeful uh, steps than you may think. Because like people in in the organization, they may not be sharing your content because they think they're not supposed to be using company time to be on social media channels, right? And so make it official that you are looking to build a workforce that helps promote the content. That's why we do it. Yeah, we've seen also we've seen a real uptake in or uptick in sharing on LinkedIn, and I wonder whether it's because people do feel comfortable having that open at work. I mean, I've been surprised at how well we've been doing recently on LinkedIn, but we're seeing a lot more sharing as a general trend uh, on LinkedIn. So I don't know whether people are looking at their feeds a lot more on LinkedIn, but we're certainly seeing from the data a lot more sharing on LinkedIn. Someone's mentioned the point about sharing social shares on mobile slows site loads down. It does. So I mean. I would have different versions, obviously, for your mobile and your, your desktop versions. Uh, somebody asked a question about Google Plus. Um, how useful is it to use Google Plus? Well, I guess I made it through the whole presentation without <laughs> mentioning them. Uh, <laughs> so. I think uh, Google Plus is a big dud and a failure, and the only people that actually care are marketers. But I could be wrong. You know, I, I, did, I don't say those things uh, because uh, I dislike the um, um, platform. In fact, I think they did a wonderful job, but they never really brought much original that wasn't available to you on other platforms. And therefore, like if, if, if you know, I have teenage daughters and if I started a conversation with Google Plus about them, it'd be a short one because they wouldn't even know what it is. So it, its future isn't bright. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I mean, it's, and we see it on shares. I mean, um, there are very few shares that take place on Google Plus. There are a few exceptions: some uh, photography, imagery stuff, some tech stuff goes on Google Plus. But as a general rule, it's not a big platform for for those things. Um, I'm going to have to wrap up now because we're, we're sort of five minutes over. Uh, Great people having to to leave us. But firstly, a really big thank you to Barry for which is a fantastic webinar. Just so much stuff in it. You've 
all got to have ideas you can take away and use from, from Barry's webinar today. As I say, we will send you uh, slides, we'll send you a copy of the recording and we'll get back on questions and also look out for a, a blog post which covers some of the things that we've covered today. So I really hope it, it was useful for you. Do contact uh, Barry or I, any questions on Twitter and we'll get straight back to you. But thank you everyone for your time today and thank you very much again, Barry. All right, thanks for having me, Steve. It was a pleasure. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have lovely days and uh, speak to you all soon. Take care. Bye.